The unicorn and the red bull stood facing each other at the arch of the bow, and the unicorn's back was to the sea. The bull moved in slowly, not charging, but pressing her almost gently towards the water, never touching her. She did not resist him. Her horn was dark and her head was down, and the bull was as much her master as he had been on the plain of Hagsgate before she became the Lady Amalthea. It might have been that same hopeless dawn, except for the sea. Yet she was not altogether beaten. She backed away until one hind foot actually stepped into the water. At that, she sprang through the sudden, the sullen smolder of the red bull and ran away along the beach so swift and light that the wind of her passing blew her footprints off the sand. The bull went after her. Do something, a hoarse voice said to Schmendrick, as Molly had said it a long time ago. Prince Lear stood behind him, his face bloody and his eyes mad. He looked like King Haggard. Do something, he said. You have the power. You changed her into a unicorn. Do something now to save her. I will kill you if you don't. He showed the magician his hands. I cannot, Schmendrick answered him quietly. Not all the magic in the world can help her now. If she will not fight him, she must go into the sea with the others. Neither magic nor murder will help her. Molly heard small waves slapping on the sand. The tide was beginning to turn. She saw no unicorns tumbling in the water, though she did look for them, willing them to be there. What if it's too late? What if they drifted out on the last ebb tide, out to the deepest sea where no ships go, because of the kraken and the sea drake, and because of the floating jungles of wrack that tangle and drown even these? She will never find them, then. Would she stay with me? Then what is magic for? Prince Lear demanded wildly. What use is wizardry if it cannot save a unicorn? He gripped the magician's shoulder hard to keep from falling. Schmendrick did not turn his head. With a touch of sad mockery in his voice, he said, That's what heroes are for. They could not see the unicorn for the hugeness of the bull, but suddenly she doubled on her track and came flying up the beach towards them. Blind and as patient as the sea, the red bull followed her, his hooves gouging great ditches in the damp sand. Smoke and fire... Spray and storm, they came on together, neither one gaining, and Prince Lear gave a soft grunt of understanding. Yes, of course, he said. That is exactly what heroes are for. Wizards make no difference, so they say that does nothing. But heroes are meant to die for unicorns. He let go of Schmendrick's shoulder, smiling to himself. There is a basic fallacy in your reasoning, Schmendrick began indignantly. But the prince never heard what it was. The unicorn flashed by them, her breath streaming blue-white and her head carried too high, and Prince Lear leaped into the path of the Red Bull. For a moment, he disappeared entirely, like a feather in the flame. The bull ran over him and left him lying on the ground. One side of his face cuddled too hard into the sand, and one leg kicked the air three times before it stopped. He fell without a cry, and Schmendrick and Molly alike were stricken as silent as he. But the unicorn turned. The red bull halted when she did, and wheeled to put her once more between himself and the sea. He began his mincing, dancing in dance again, but he might have been a courting bird for all the attention the unicorn paid him. She stood motionless, staring at the twisted body of Prince Lear. The tide was grumbling in hard now, and the beach was already a slice narrower. Whitecaps and Skipper's daughters spilled up into the sprawling dawn, but Molly Grew still saw no other unicorn but her own. Over the castle the sky was scarlet, and on the highest tower, King Haggard stood up as clear and black as a winter tree. Molly could see the straight scar of his mouth, 
and his nails darkening as he gripped the parapet. But the castle cannot fall now. Only Lear could have made it fall. Suddenly the unicorn screamed. It was not at all like the challenging bell with which she had first met the Red Bull. It was an ugly, squalling wail of sorrow and loss and rage such as no immortal creature had ever given. The castle quaked, and King Haggard shrank back with one arm across his face. The Red Bull hesitated, shuffling in the sand, lowing doubtfully. The unicorn cried out again and reared up like a scimitar. The sweet sweep of her body made Molly close her eyes, but she opened them again in time to see the unicorn leap at the red bull, and the bull swerved her out of her way. The unicorn's horn was light again, burning and shivering like a butterfly. Once again she charged, and again the bull gave ground heavy with perplexity, but still quick as a fish. His own horns were the color and likeness of lightning, and the slightest swing of his head made her stagger, but he retreated and retreated, backing steadily down into the beach as she had done. She lunged after him, driving to kill, but she could not reach him. She might have been stabbing at a shadow or at a memory. So the red bull fell back without giving battle, until she had stalked him to the water's edge. There he made his stand, with the surf swirling about his hooves and the sand rushing away under them. He would neither flight nor fly, and she knew now that she could never destroy him. Still, she set herself for another charge while he muttered wonderingly in his throat. For Molly grew. The world hung motionlessly in that glass moment. As though she were standing on a higher tower than King Haggard's, she looked down on a pale pairing of land, where a toy man and a woman stared with their knitted eyes at a clay bull and a tiny ivory unicorn, abandoned playthings. There was another doll, too, half buried, and a sandcastle with a stick king propped up in one tilled turret. The tide would take it all in a moment, and nothing would be left but the flaccid birds of the beach, hopping in circles. Then Schmendrick shook her back to his side, saying, Molly! Fall far out to sea, the combers were coming in, the long, he heavy rollers curling over white across their green hearts, tearing themselves to smoke on the sandbars and the slimy rocks rasping up the beach with a sound like fire. The birds flew up in yelling clumps, their strident outrage lost in the cry of the waves like pins. And in the whiteness of the whiteness, flowering in the tattered water, their bodies arching with the streaked marbled hollows of the waves, their manes and tails and the fragile beards of the males burning in the sunlight their eyes as dark and jeweled as the deep sea, and the shining of their horns, the seashell si shining of their horns. The horns came riding in like the rainbow masts of silver ships. But they would not come to land while the bull was there. They rolled in the shallows, swirling together as madly as frightened fish when the nets are being hauled up, no longer with the sea but losing it. Hundreds were born with each swell and hurled against the ones already struggling to keep from being shoved ashore, and they in their turn struck out desperately, rearing and stumbling, stretching their long, cloudy necks far back. The unicorn lowered her head one last time and hurled herself at the red bull. If he had been either true flesh or a windy ghost, the blow would have burst him like rotten fruit. But he turned away, unnoticing, and walked slowly into the sea. The unicorns in the water floundered wildly to let him by, stamping and slashing the surf into a roiling mist, which their horns turned rainbow. But on the beach, and atop the cliff, and up and down through all Haggard's kingdom, the land sighed with his weight, 
when his weight had passed from it. He strode out a long way before he began to swim. The hugest waves broke no higher than his hawks, and the timid tide ran away from him. But when at last he let himself sink onto the flood, then a great surge of the sea stood up behind him, a green and black swell as deep and as smooth and hard as the wind. It gathered in silence, folding from one horizon to the other, until, for a moment, it actually hid the red bull's humped shoulders and sloping back. Schmendrick lifted the dead prince, and he and Molly ran until the cliff's face stopped them. The wave fell like a sunburst of chains. Then the unicorns came out of the sea. Molly never saw them clearly. They were a light leaping towards her and a cry that dazzled her eyes. She was wise enough to know that no mortal was ever meant to see all the unicorns in the world, and she tried to find her own unicorn and look only at her, but there were too many of them, and they were too beautiful. Blind as the bull, she moved to meet them, holding out her arms. The unicorns would surely have run her down, as the red bull had trampled Prince Lear, for they were mad with freedom. But Schmendrick spoke, and they streamed to the right and left of Molly and Lear and himself, some even springing over them as the sea shatters on a rock and then comes whirling together again. All around Molly, they flowed and flowered a light as impossible as snow set afire, while thousands of cloven hooves sang by like cymbals. She stood very still, neither weeping nor laughing, for her joy was too great for her body to understand. Look up, Schmendrick said, the castle is falling. She turned and saw that the towers were melting as the unicorns sprang up the cliff and flowed around them, exactly as though they had been made out of the sand and the sea were sliding in. The castle came down in great cold chunks that turned thin and waxen as they swirled in the air until they disappeared. It crumbled and vanished without, without a sound, and it left no ruins, either on land or in the memories of the two who watched it fall. A minute later, they could not remember where it had stood or how it had looked. But King Haggard, who was quite real, fell down through the wreckage of his disenchanted castle like a knife dropped through the clouds. Molly heard him laugh once, as though he had expected it. Very little ever surprised King Haggard.